Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sean Casey. I'm the director of the Berkeley Center here at Georgetown University. I'm being told to speak into the microphone. Sorry about that. Is that, is that better? Great. Thank you. Um, it's my distinct privilege to introduce to you our guest this afternoon, Associate Professor of American Studies, Melanie McAllister. She's also a professor of international affairs, and that, that's a very unique combination in the academy, and that certainly comes through uh, in the book that we're discussing today. She teaches at George Washington University, and uh, I'd like to welcome you, first of all. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, this is just a superb book. Uh, I've been mesmerized by it. I see a lot of characters I know. I thought I knew this area, and I learned new things just about on every page of the book. So it's really an amazing work. It's compelling, it's path-breaking, and it is indeed a, a learned book. And it's always a pleasure to talk to an author who's invested a lot of time, energy, and expertise. So thank you uh, for coming, Melody. Uh, our procedure today is we're going to have a conversation for about half the time, and then we will pivot somewhere near the, the middle uh, to audience question and answer. And I ask sort of three or four uh, things from you. First of all, uh, when you we get to that point, uh, we'll just recognize you uh, from your seat. Tell us who you are. Tell us your affiliation, number one. Uh, secondly, uh, actually ask a question. Uh, here in Washington, D.C., we tend to disguise our sermons as questions. Uh, I'm asking you to dispense with the sermon and get to the question. So the, the more succinct you are, the more questions uh, that, that Melanie can field. If you're looking for a place to offer sermons, see me afterwards. I've got contact at Divinity Schools. We can get you right in and get you trained. But that's not what we do here. Uh, so think about your, your questions and try to form them uh, uh, succinctly. The last note is that we are selling copies of the book. And I think uh, if, if you've got a few minutes after you, you are available to sign them, I think we're selling them for $30. Uh, and we'll have them here on the front table. Uh, so give us a couple of minutes at the end to sort of transition some books up here so if people want to buy them, uh, you'll have that opportunity. Um, so we're going to jump right in. Uh, so uh, again, thank you, Melanie. And first of all, I, I guess the, the question that occurs to me is when and how did this subject pop into your head as an idea? Because really no one's done this. No one's tried to look at the, the sort of global scope of evangelicalism, and you're filling a huge gap. So can you tell us a little bit about when the light bulb went off in your head that this, this was a book project and you were the person to write it? <laughs> well, first let me say thank you for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. And um, I have to say, I think this is the book I never planned to write. I, um, I was raised as a Southern Baptist in North Carolina, so people often think, oh, you must be writing this autobiographical story in some way. But really, I don't know if this is the place to say that, but I really wasn't that interested in religion, and I didn't want to write about religion. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I wrote a first book about US involvement in international affairs that looked at American images of the Middle East. And in it, I did write about religion, about both uh, African American Muslims and their images of the Middle East, and American evangelical Christians and their um, relationship with Israel. And so then the book came out, the first edition of my first book came out uh, on, in September 2001. And so mm. it got a lot of attention as a result of that. And as after it came out, there were a number of instances of evangelicals, uh, Franklin Graham and others, talking about Islam in very negative ways. And so I thought, you know, maybe I'll just write a kind of quick little book about evangelical views of Islam in post 9-11 or before and after 9-11. So that was uh, 12 years ago. <laughs> and <laughs> what happened is that as I started researching that, I became aware that there was a lot more going on in terms of how American evangelical Christians were thinking about global issues than I had been aware of. Um, that the Middle East was important, but Africa and Latin America and Asia and other places were also very, very important. And then I realized if I wanted to understand that better, I needed to pay attention to um, an earlier period and really look back at the Cold War. So I ended up writing a not little book uh, from the, really begins in the 50s and goes up into the, to the 2010s. Uh -huh. Yeah, and so I, I think that, that the timeline there sometimes 
the, the events of the day can shape a, an academic project in ways you don't anticipate when yeah. you, you first jump in. I have a friend who says that looking at the evangelical world on any kind of specific issue is like trying to herd feral cats because it's so decentralized. And a lot of us <clears> in religious studies analogize off of, say, the, the Global Anglican Network or the Roman Catholic Church. And that just doesn't work when it comes to evangelicals. One of the things I was struck by in your, your book is how you frame your three sections. Uh, you call the first section networks. The second section is body politics. And the third uh, section is emotions. I'm curious if you can tell us what do each of those sectors mean for you? And how did you, how did you come up with that framework as a way of kind of framing this very complex discussion? Yeah, it was a way of trying to herd, really, to say evangelicals are so such a broad category of, of groups and peoples. And I'm thinking not just about the US, but about uh, evangelicals internationally, and not just about white evangelicals, but about African-American evangelicals in particular. Um, I, I don't look very much at Latino uh, evangelicals or Arab evangelicals, though I hope other people will um, soon. Um, but it actually started with its attention to emotions. So the first, one of the first things I wrote about evangelicals was an article, you know, almost 10 years ago now. And in it, I coined the term enchanted internationalism. And that was a way of my talking about how a lot of the evangelical engagements I was seeing, particularly with Africa, um, had a kind of emotive aspect that I wanted to try to understand. Not, I'm not saying emotion as opposed to rational. When I, I, when I talk about evangelicals having emotions, I don't mean to imply that other people are rational and evangelicals are emotional. I think this is true for emotions are part of every story we might tell in some way. But I wanted to talk about this sense of enchantment that um, many Americans had that they looked at Africans and sometimes Latin Americans, sometimes Asians, and saw them as in some ways more authentic, more truly Christian, more committed to their faith, and so they idealized those folks often. But that also come, sometimes had a kind of primitivism quality to it as well, Con, uh, a sense of wanting those people to be a certain way in order to, um, to sample it almost, or to engage with it and get something out of it for oneself. So it was a very complex emotional um, stance that I wanted to try to trace. And that is really present in many places throughout the book, but I focus more on it near the end of the book, as it, because I see it as happening, especially in the kind of 21st century, as an uh, important kind of category for how many evangelicals have seen parts of Africa and Asia. Um, the bodily piece is, is this second major framing for the book in the sense that I see, you know, Christianity is a faith built around the notion of a suffering body, around Jesus' uh, death on the cross and the suffering there and the redemption that people see coming out of that. And so it makes sense to me that sanctified suffering is a big part of many Christians' um, emotional framing and political framing of things, but certainly I saw it among evangelicals. And so I wanted to pay attention to how people see that sanctified suffering. And in the book, I talk about it also as um, victim identification, where people both identify other people who they see as victims, who they might want to be in solidarity with or to help in some way, whether that be victims of Soviet repression or victims of apartheid. But they also, um, evangelicals can tend to see themselves as victims, to see themselves as affiliated with Christians who are suffering in other parts of the world and therefore identify themselves as part of a global community of sufferers. Right. So I thought the body was important. And I'll say the network, should I say that quickly? Yeah, please, no. And so the networks, um, which I talk about mostly in the first part of the book, but which is absolutely crucial throughout, really came when a, a friend of mine was reading an early draft of the book and she said, there are a lot of seminaries in this book. <laughs> And I thought, OK, that, that's probably social death for me. But uh, it's still true that seminaries matter a great deal it, to these international networks that I'm talking about, and Bible colleges and other kinds of places where 
Um, both all sorts of people from the global south are coming to the U.S. to train, but also um, theologians and, and professors from other parts of the world come and teach in the U.S. and have an impact on American students here. I think there's a lot of work still to be done on seminaries in other parts of the world. I'd love to see some work, for, more work, for example, on seminaries in Africa, which are changing rapidly. Um, but I was mostly looking at how people come in, in and out, students and faculty in seminaries of the U.S. And there are a lot of the other pieces of the book that there are a lot of conferences. And you know, it's hard to make conferences interesting. I try really hard. Um, you know, it's like, then there was another speech, but um, <laughs> they, they're important. And so one of the things, for example, that I noticed was how much at these conferences people had to encounter, Americans had to counter, encounter people from the global south. And increasingly, this is not a missionary relationship. This is a relationship of other church leaders with church leaders where people have to or need to are in, invited to see each other as equals and are pushed pretty hard and, and sometimes by people from the global south. Um, I'll just mention one um, example of a, a funny conference uh, event in a way. It's where the Urbana is the conference of InterVarsity Christian Fellowships. It's their every three years conference. And um, in 1970, the uh, Latin American theologian Samuel Escobar goes to Urbana. And he's talking about what people then called social concern. And he has the biggest event at Urbana that year. I mean, tons of people go, you know, sort of crowd into the room to hear him. And he starts lecturing these young people on how they should be reading Marx and Marcuse. <laughs> <laughs> and says, you know, neither Marx nor Marcuse, under, they both diagnose the world better than most of our preachers do. Now, they didn't know what we know, which is that the world's problems are due to sin. But they knew some things, and you should be reading them. And I, th I think this is, I really looked. I don't think anybody else has ever quoted Marx and Marcuse at an evangelical conference, but it did happen. <laughs> and, and, and so it, it, that's a key. I mean, that was very helpful for me to see that the Lausanne type meetings and the, the uh, InterVarsity meetings there in Urbana really were formative in a way and, and were sort of in early introducers of new ideas that continue to reverberate mm -hmm. uh, going forward. Now, when you, 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 pr you uh, sort of predicted the next question, you, you talk about these two strands that begin to emerge, at least in American evangelicalism, as some of these international evangelicals come and speak. One is what you call uh, the church growth movement that was led by uh, Donald McGavern and then later C. Peter Wagner, I think both mainly out of Fuller Seminary. And writing a history of Fuller's rise and decline would be an interesting history too. Uh, so can you say a little bit more about both that strand as well as this one that's oriented to what a social justice concern? Sort of how did they, how did they bump into each other then in the 60s and 70s? And how would you say, if you kind of jump to today, where where is their relative power and strength uh, over against each other or in the wider evangelical world? Um, <clears throat> there is a really good book on Fuller, actually, um, by, it's by George Marston, I think, oh, that right. um, tells some of the stories that, that I drew on in the book. Um, yeah, so I, it's interesting. One of the s sort of contributions I hope the book makes is to talk about the presence and the power of the, so the movement for social concern in the 60s and 70s. And the really what, in 1974, seemed like the ascendance of a, a left wing of global evangelicalism and the sort of shocking fact that that did not stay in ascendance. Because um, coming out of Lausanne, there were this group of um, people, many of them le led by Latin American theologians like Escobar and Rene Padilla, but other people as well were supportive. Many other people were supportive. And they came out of Lausanne really thinking they had won. They had uh, an alternative to the main Lausanne document, but they had also influenced the Lausanne document. They said, we want, um, <coughs> and they were especially critical of Americans, but they wanted uh, these Americans and others who thought that evangelicalism was about counting converts. They were very critical and said, we need to be thinking, they, 
Um, there's a, let me just say this inside, there's a meme in the book, really, which is uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So I have, like, how many different times can I see people quoting Dietrich Bonhoeffer, either explicitly or explicitly, over the course of 50 years, and it's a lot. Um, and so when Rene Padilla goes to Lausanne and he gives a lecture about, uh, a sermon about cheap grace and says we need to be paying attention to materialism, racism, oppression, all of these things. Of course, he's coming out of Latin America where um, liberation theology is important, so he has a, a very specific context, but many people are quite supportive and they come out of Lausanne thinking, we won. You know, we've got the whole evangelical movement is going to be focused on social concern now, and they really um, were quite surprised when that didn't quite happen the way they expected. And I think two things affected it. One is that, that the church growth movement was quite strong at Lausanne and remained strong in all sorts of ways. And it's not that you can't be in favor of church growth and in favor of social concern, but in practical terms, those were different groups of people focusing in different ways. And the church growth folks really um, organized a lot of the excitement about evangelism. They were very, and so now for people who aren't in the evangelical world, when I say church growth, I'm using capital C, capital G. It's a, 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 the name of a way of thinking about missionary work. It doesn't mean just like I, my, I would like more people to come to my church on Sunday. It's a specific category of thinking about missionary work. And, Really, they were very data-driven. They had computer printouts. They brought World Vision was involved. Fuller was involved, other people. And they really said, we need to focus our energies on reaching as many people as possible. And they're actually really critical of a lot of different strategies of missionary work where they thought they, the uh, Americans and others kept sending missionaries to the easy places and not to the hard places, but also to the places where many people had already heard about Jesus and not to the other places. And so they had a specific movement about that, but they got a lot of excitement, a lot of energy around you know, organizing the data, figuring out where the unreached people were, unreached peoples were, counting them, learning about them. But it was, um, it, it was seen as a kind of alternative, reaching people, reaching for souls as an alternative to focusing on uh, worldly social concern, although both sides would have said, we want both in some way or another, but in practice it was different. The people who most learned the lesson of social concern uh, was the religious right. So, and I, and I talk a lot about Francis Schaeffer as somebody who, who crosses the line between the kind of liberals and the religious right in this period, moves from being more liberal-ish to more conservative. Um, but they were like, yes, we are not just interested in counting converts. We believe in being organized around issues we care about. They just cared about different issues. So they were focused more on abortion, more on uh, Israel, more on um, uh, gender issues, those kinds of things. And um, that was, I remember interviewing Ron Sider, who wrote Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. And he said, like, yeah, the people who heard us were the people who ended up um, kind of destroying what we worked for. One of the other ironies there was, if I understand McGavern's history, he, he had been a missionary himself, mm -hmm. came back to the states, and, and his theory was homogenous groups grow faster. So find, you know, move into a suburb and, and target one demographic, one race. Uh, so it was both, it was ironic since it was driven by an international experience. But it had probably had its most impact here in the states, you, you know, with the seeker-friendly services and the Bill Hybels sort of trajectory that came out of that. And it was yeah. more, it was less reach out to the whole world, but find your slice and organize your community around that homogenous group because like attracts like was was part of his theory. Yeah, it's a very that part of the theory is very um, controversial and has that's one of the reasons why church growth is less present in the in the movement today except in the in the person of mega churches so to speak because they really were seeker friendly in a way that he was often interested in but I, I would say that actually it did have a global reach in the sense of the this notion of unreached peoples of thinking about peoples as groups rather than um, as individuals and and saying let's think about this is really actually a people group that they named uh, you know, Muslim farmers in the Punjab as a group that might need to be reached. What are the categories, you know, that they need? How can we understand their culture and how can we reach them as a group? So that homogenous unit principle 
actually did have an international yeah. um, framing, although I don't know that that, I think it, it actually did end up affecting more how Americans thought about missionary work than actually how missionary work was done. Yeah, and that, that, that's a very interesting distinction. Um, let me, I, I, at one point I tried to cover the lists in the, the geographical locations you cover, and the list got far too long and complicated. So let me, let me just try to highlight a, a, some questions in, in a couple of places. You have, you have a very interesting chapter on Israel and how that becomes sort of a, a central concern, sort of post-67 war and all of that uh, for, for many, many evangelicals. I'm curious if, if we f fast forward to today, you know, arguably a part of President Trump's popularity today is that he, he made the promise to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and he has now done that. So mm -hmm. you, can, you can check that box for good or for ill that, that he's, he, he right. made good on that promise. I'm curious, um, is there anything else that can be done politically by this administration that will pay off politically going down the road for the administration? If, does that make sense? I for, mean, you mean for evangelicals? For, for evangelicals, right. Is, is there a way that he can cement and deepen the ties uh, <coughs> between this administration and evangelicals um, beyond the, the sort of embassy move? Is there? I'm going to do this thing that people do where I'm going to use that as an opportunity to answer a slightly different question. <laughs> That's allowed. This is Washington, um, right? <laughs> which is, let's talk about the evangelicals who Trump has alienated. Um, and I'm going to specifically talk about evangelicals of color. Um, mm -hmm. I did a, a, an article this summer where I interviewed a few different evangelicals of color and tried to look around and see what people were saying about their relationship to um, the evangelical movement overall since, the, since Trump was elected. And the title of the article is A Kind of Homelessness because um, you know there are many different you know, evangelicals of color are a diverse group. They don't all think the same thing. I definitely skewed my interview to people who were unhappy, uh, but uh, it wasn't hard to do. Uh, it wasn't hard to find. Uh, and the person who said a kind of homelessness is um, Nikki Toyana Setso, who's a, the new um, executive director of Evangelicals for Social Action, so you know, definitely on the evangelical left, but. She, she had a great metaphor for it. She said, you know, and I, and I interviewed other people in more conservative parts of the movement too, but she said, you know, it used to be that we would go to, first thing she said, I will say, is, is that she found her appreciation of herself as an Asian American woman in the evangelical church. That it was in church that she came to understand that her gifts were connected to her race, not separate from it. Then her gender was part of what her gifts were. So she's a she's a she's a true believer, right? That the chef mean is very meaningful to her. But she said, it used to be that you'd go to evangelical white church, largely white churches, and you could say, well, you know, they're not thinking about racism, but they got other things. There's a lot of things to do. We're just gonna you sort of give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, and she said, since the Trump, since the election of Trump, she felt like. She would go to churches and think, did you, like, use you, you, my friend, sitting next to me in church, was that whole Trump is a racist thing just not a deal breaker for you? Like, is that, was that, is that what you thought? That was okay in some way? And she said, so she feels like that the evangelical, white evangelical church doesn't know it, but it's like her friend who is a, is a Latino living in, New Mexico and said, you know, her family's been there for a very long time. They never moved to the U.S. from Mexico. The border moved over them, right? And she said, that's what's happened to white evangelicals. They don't know it, but the border has moved. And you could used to be able to be given the benefit of doubt with no strong statements about racism and no strong statements about being on the side of your uh, evangelical brothers and sisters of color. And now that, that border has moved and you no longer have that benefit of the doubt. So I see a real fracturing that I think um, those people who support Trump, I, I don't think he could do anything more to learn their love or less to, to get, to, to lose it. I mean, I think they're in. But I do see the movement itself pretty fractured around that. Okay, that's very interesting. 
you, you tell you have a very interesting chapter about Uganda and the 2014 anti-homosexual law uh, that was passed and now has been overturned, and the role that uh, Rick Warren from Saddleback Church played in that, where he's trying to thread a needle. On the one hand, he's very active in HIV AIDS treatment and making drugs available, and yet on the other hand, uh, he wants to be careful that he's not endorsing a theological or rhetorical position that leads to actual violence against LGBTQ folk. Can you tell us uh, kind of what that story was about and how he had tried to sort of thread that needle between these sort yeah. of two different forces? Yeah. So I wrote that chapter in a way, I started with um, a, a somewhat different concern, which was that so many people who told the story of the uh, um, anti-homosexuality the law in Uganda sort of wanted to tell a story about white American evangelicals coming over and making people in Uganda hate gay people. Hmm. That it was a kind of ideological injection from um, the guy who wrote uh, the pink triangle, I mean the pink swastika, Scott Lively. I once said Scott Appleby in a public <laughs> event, that was not good. <laughs> we'll make sure I get that right. right. Uh, no, not a leading Catholic scholar. And, uh, so Scott Lively wrote this book, The Pink Swastika. He did go and do all these trainings. I mean, he's a very nefarious character, as were as were some others. But the history of uh, very uh, conservative views about homosexuality is a longer history that we know um, has uh, uh, is quite traceable in the Anglican Communion from the uh, 1998 Lambeth meetings, where they first. Um, did not pass a resolution <coughs> saying that um, uh, LGBT people should be treated uh, equally and, uh, and uh, opposed ordination and, uh, of uh, gay men and, and uh, women. So I was sort of telling the story of saying when we take African agency seriously, as I try really hard to do in the book overall, that does not mean that Africans are always taking the liberal position, pushing Americans to uh, support uh, debt relief for Africa, which they did, or HIV AIDS funding, which they did, but also um, have quite some quite conservative positions, many of them. Again, they're a diverse group. And so I was looking at that history, and that's when Rick Warren showed up, because Warren had a relationship with Martin Sempa, who was one of the uh, evangelicals in Uganda most responsible for the anti-homosexuality bill. He had invited Scott Lively. He had done all this other stuff. He, uh, you know, pushed in the, in the parliament for it. And he had been to both of Rick Warren's first two HIV AIDS summits in 2005, 2006. Um, you know, Kay Warren had stood up from the podium and said how much they loved him and respected him. He'd done trainings on HIV education, which were, you know, conservative in being, a, you know, um, abstinence only education. He hadn't taken the positions he had. To, he took later. When he did take those positions and became in favor of the anti-homosexuality law, and I'm going <clears> to <throat> say in fa Rick Warren's favor, it did take him three months to speak up about this. I don't think it's because he was unclear on whether he thought gay people should be clear killed. I'm quite clear that Rick Warren did not believe that. Um, he says he was working behind the scenes to try to influence people. Maybe that was true. I don't know. But when he did do his YouTube open letter to the pastors of Uganda, he had to know what was going to happen and what did happen, which is the pastors who were supporting the law, and there were many of them in Uganda across a lot of different um, uh, denominations and communities, uh, really accused him of imperialism, of colonial attitudes. Like you, who do you think? Do you think you were the, you know, literally the decentralized thing? You don't, you're not the, you're not the Pope of us. Like we are equals. You don't tell us. We read the Bible too. We have our rights to be trusted to do the right thing, and we don't want to hear it from you. And so, and he surely knew, having been involved in Africa for a long time, that he was going to be subject to that. So it's a very complicated dynamic whereby he is really trying to find a way to be both against the law and to maintain his credibility and connections with African uh, pastors. And it did not go so well for him in Uganda. That dynamic, uh, I have a friend who's uh, president of an evangelical college, which I shall not name. Uh, and probably 20 years ago, they moved into the uh, semester abroad, year abroad 
you know, whatever movement in higher education today. And they actually survey incoming attitudes, political and social attitudes of their students when they come in and give them the same test when they exit. And they have noticed uh, in this sort of, again, this is a stereotype between sort of American parochialism and imperialism in a more cosmopolitan evangelical view, the students who, who skew more towards the, the cosmopolitan view, there's a direct correlation to those students who studied abroad versus those who haven't. So that, that tension you just identified is alive and well, I think, today in the sort of millennial generation of, of evangelical college students. Uh, and their institutions have an ambivalence towards that as well, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I write a lot about short-term missions in the book. Yes. And um, it's, it's interesting. So I'm going to make a distinction for a minute between short-term missions and study abroad, although I'm not sure that there's as much a distinction as we might want there to be. But short-term missions for a week or two, um, some studies have shown that actually they can reinforce stereotypical attitudes among uh, any, any group of people who go on them. The sort of the happy poor people story that a lot of uh, young people come back with when they go on a short-term mission, you know, they seem so happy. They don't seem as materialistic as us. They don't need as much as we do, which was not the message that I think the organizers generally want people to have, you know. But they, that happens a lot. And so one of the things that has happened in evangelical communities, which has not happened in necessarily, say, training for my students at GW who go do a, a week abroad over their spring break, alternative spring break, is a very self-conscious discussion about how can we prevent this kind of lady bountiful attitude among people who go abroad? How can we train people in a way that helps them not do those kind of things? And it's a really complicated thing, especially for any kind of very short-term trip. Um, there, one of the guys I write about in the book is a, a pastor from Wisconsin, and his brother <coughs> is a or was a professor at Wheaton College which is <clears throat> you know the evangelical mothership essentially I mean this is the place where so many generations of people are trained and um, <clears throat> and Paul Rob Robinson um, ran something called the hunger program there and I interviewed Paul he's they're both kind of amazing and Paul had grown up he was a missionary kid from Congo he'd grown up and here he is at Wheaton teaching these kids and he had them train, he had them take a class for a semester in the fall before they could do a semester abroad in the spring. And when they did the semester abroad, he, had, he said to them, you are going to be a burden on the people you are going to see. You are not helping at all. They have <clears throat> chosen to allow you to come live in their homes in this poor village in Congo or that poor village in Rwanda because they hope you will learn something and come back and be useful. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was really, you know, straight up. And I thought that was just amazing. I thought this is the kind of thing that people, we need to be doing a lot more of across a lot of different uh, communities when we have so much wealth in the U.S., so much money is spent sending people abroad. Just American churches, not counting secular versions or Jewish versions, probably send 1.6 million people a year on short-term missions. Mm. And so that's an enormous like pull of money out of churches, pull of money out of families for send, send people abroad. And the sense that the training piece of it is so small often that it ends up uh, reinforcing the kind of stereotypes that you might want to be challenging, I think is one of the things that short-term missions folks have been thinking about pretty hard and that really all of us need to be thinking about pretty hard. And you do highlight that there are internal <clears throat> evangelical critics of this movement. It's not like they, those insights are coming from the outside exclusively, but there are church folk and, and academics who, who have oh, yeah. deep reservations. That was almost, a, it was almost a fun chapter to write because I thought there's nothing I can say about short-term missions that some evangelical hasn't already said in a more sardonic and witty way. So I, I mean, there's been a lot of critique and in debate, because everyone knows in some ways this ship has sailed. I mean, there are a lot less people going abroad after 2008 for financial reasons. More people were doing domestic short-term stuff, which is not free of some of those same issues. But, um, but the sense that people were saying, we have got to um, 
go beyond this kind of simplistic pieties of it's good for you to go abroad and learn something is really coming from evangelical and other Christian commentators. I'm really fascinated about the role that Sudan and South Sudan play in several of your chapters. I'm going to ask you to talk more about that. But you, you, you do have a chapter about uh, the redemption of slaves on the part of, of uh, particularly an African-American couple in Boston. Uh, I've had the privilege of actually knowing uh, many years ago. You also talk about the role of Christians in, in the Sudan is in some ways is framed by folk as a, a, a Islam versus Christianity, so part of the religious freedom and oppression of, of Christians. And then also uh, evangelical Christians have played a role in the birth and the struggles of South Sudan too. So can you kind of walk us through that, that interesting set of narratives? Yeah, it's, you know, it's something I never expected. I had no particular uh, background in Sudan going into this book, and the fact that it was so important in the 90s and early 2000s really forced me to think a lot more about it as a place really where, in the period of the Sudanese Civil War, um, American evangelical Christians became really involved in what they saw, and I think merely misunderstood as a Christian-Muslim conflict, but which did include that component of you know a, a, a largely Christian population in south in the south of Sudan, and a largely but not entirely Muslim population in the north. Um, I the the first part of the discussion of South Sudan is talks about its the way that Sudan figured in the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998 and the debates about Sudan among others as, you know, how will the U.S. stand and what will, what kind of um, positions will the U.S. take on Sudan and how can we push the U.S. to be more critical of Sudan's carrying out of the war in the South. Um, but the redemption, the slave redemption is what really captured me. Um, this was because it is more, I, I do have a bias in favor of kind of more grassroots kind of activity or cultural uh, um, and political activity that happens from ordinary people. And so one of the things is that a group of people, including uh, a, a large, a, a very visible group of African American ministers and others, got involved with Christian Solidarity International and then Christian Solidarity Worldwide to. Um, organized to redeem slaves who were taken in South Sudan. Now that means that in the course of the war, sometimes people were taken from villages in South Sudan and then taken to the north and forced to in, in forced labor. Um, that the slave redemption was carried out by Christian groups who then paid Arab traders from the north to go and buy back the children or women or others who had been taken and then they would bring them to the south and the Americans would pay the traders for those children. Now my just describing that should give you some sense of how controversial it was. Um, but their view was this is we aren't we aren't creating a market the mar the price of slaves has stayed the same since we've been there we we are dealing with a reality on the ground that we're just trying to to um, respond to but also of course again the bodily suffering was crucial the notion of redemption in christian culture is so important right and of course slavery and the history of african american slavery very much resonated with people um, uh, including these african american ministers I will say just as an aside that one of the lucky things for me in writing this book is um, interviewing ministers is amazing because one of my friends, she wrote a book about Sister Rosetta Tharp, the, the African-American gospel musician, and she would interview musicians. And they would say, she would say, what, do you, what can you tell me about Rosetta? And they would say, she was nice. You know, well, she was a good guitar player. And you know, 10 minutes later, the interview is over because people don't have that much to say. They're not talkers, but preachers are talkers. And so I would say, so tell me about your trip to Sudan. And you know, three and a half hours later, we'd be done. So I learned a lot about what it meant to them. And it meant so much for these folks who were ministers to be going and being involved in these practices, being involved in Africa, and seeing themselves as helping. Um, to her credit, uh, Gloria White Hammond, who was one of the most important of these folks, um, also quickly understood that 
this was just one small part of the problem that people faced in South Sudan. And she became very involved in organizing um, to try to build wells, for example, and other kinds of basic stuff that, that um, people's poverty had sometimes, in fact, led people to actually sell their children to families in the north because they had they faced such terrible poverty. And she really did try to respond to that. Um, I went to South Sudan with a, well, what was in Southern Sudan with a church from Wisconsin, a, a mega church outside of Milwaukee, and went on a short term mission with them there, which was quite an experience, quite an incredible experience for me. Um, but it was one of the places where I learned most on the ground about the fact that ongoing, and they did have ongoing relationships between these Americans and these. Um, Sudanese created something other than missionary relationships, exploitive relationships, relationships um, that were simply enchanted. There were some of that, but these uh, the evangelicals that the folks from Elmbrook worked with were very self-confident and confident of their own role in the global community. Um, they understood themselves to be part of the global community that was moving southward, the, just like the rest of Christianity, evangelicals, um, are becoming a global South community. They understood that. One of the people they worked with closely and had an ongoing relationship later became um, the first president of the South Sudan Council of Churches after South Sudan was formed as a country. And so I talk a little bit in that book, uh, in that section of the book, about both the complexity of money, the uh, the folks from Wisconsin had a lot of money, and they would be giving a lot of money, and had already given a lot of money. Uh, and they understood that to be part of what they were doing there. But at the same time, Dick, the minister that I mentioned, um, I quote him as the, in the title to the chapter, which is called, I'm Not a Big Checkbook, because he didn't want to be seen as a big checkbook. And I was like, Dick, you're totally a big checkbook. I don't know why, <laughs> you know, how you can imagine that you're not that, whatever else you are. Um, and so the tensions around the, both that they were, I, I say in the book, and I think it's true that Robert Anchan, who I mentioned, and the other uh, evangelicals that they were working with in South Sudan, they were, who were themselves church leaders, expected and received a kind of solidarity from the folks in Wisconsin. But there was also a relationship around money that no one could deny that was a relationship of power. And so that reality was something they had to negotiate. Well, I, I want to be cognizant of the time. Uh, so why don't we take this time to pivot to your question. So again, raise your hand. I'll call on you. Uh, tell us who you are, what your affiliation is, and then try to keep it, keep it short. So yes. Um, my name is Aaliyah Crook, and I'm with the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. Um, my question is, what do you think what do you think the best way to engage um, American and international evangelical Christian leaders in interfaith dialogue would be? Interfaith dialogue? Mm -hmm. Do you mean interfaith dialogue internationally or evangelical leaders in the U.S. involved in interfaith dialogue with other um, people in the U.S.? Evangelical leaders with internationally and nationally <coughs> with other um, international and national leaders, just trying yeah. to make those it is. prejudice. Yeah. Um, you know, there are folks uh, in the evangelical community who have been working on that. Um, I think of the Institute for Global Engagement, where um, there's been, uh, first Robert Seipel, now Chris Seipel, who had, have, had, have done a lot of work really trying to um, talk about respectful dialogue with Muslims. Um, it's not, for them, it's not quite the same as it is sometimes for ecumenical Christians who are engaged in religious dialogue in that the outcome is not going to be we are all kind of in the same place. I mean, you know, people engaged in religious dialogue always say they end up stronger in their own faith at not changing their faith or anything. but. Um, you know, evangelicals, by and large, this is not true for everybody, um, have a little bit more um, suspicion about interfaith dialogue because they believe there is only one way to heaven and other people don't have it. Um, but I think there are people who've 
done a very good job of proving that that doesn't mean that respectful, engaged relationships can't happen. And I think um, IG is one of the places, there are others, where people are trying to say, let's talk about being respectful of other people, not just as individuals, but respectful of, you know, uh, Bob Seibel used to say, respectful of their faith as well. And um, does that mean you don't do missionary work? No. But it does mean that in any, you have to sort of know what encounter you're in in a given moment. And this is either a missionary encounter or it's not. And he's really, I think, quite clear about trying to make that distinction. Um, so I think there are people who are maybe um, better equipped than me to say exactly how it should be done, but they are doing it. Marjorie Mandelstam Balzer, Anthropology in Berkeley Center. Um, my question has to do with your fascinating phrase, uh, term, enchanted evangelicalism, and the issue uh, that I'm hearing of the, the timing on it. Maybe I'm asking about disenchanted evangelical um, activities, because I, I think I hear you saying that there's been a, a kind of downturn from some high expectations. So I was wondering if you could give us a few more examples of, of that dynamic over time, putting it in a time context. Thanks. I think that's a really good question. Um, so I think that there are, I'll go backwards for a minute just to talk about the apartheid era because there is a lot of encounters but, um, of Americans with Christians in South Africa, evangelical Christians, black and white in South Africa, who are um, uh, anti-apartheid. And so as Americans have to engage with South African Christians who are opposed to apartheid, they're Sort of, you know, I'm going to assume they're sort of already going in with certain ideas about African authenticity and Africans as um, being, you know, highly religious Christians when they're when they're Christian, um, and they definitely were engaging with Africans in that period. And because this is, I'm now I'm thinking about the 80s, you know, had been engaging with African leaders coming out of Lausanne and others to think about social concern issues. But one of the things that happens in the apartheid period in the 80s is that um, apartheid is an explicitly political demand. Ending apartheid is an explicitly political demand. And asking Americans to get on our side and helping us end apartheid is an explicitly political demand. And it's a case where um, so I guess I'm not thinking about change over time as much as this tension that continues, uh, that, it, that it plays out in all sorts of different ways. Um, it, it's a tension for Americans because they want to often say, no, we're here to like have another church conference, right? Right, right. we're not political. And we're not political. So David Howard, who's quite a conservative guy, who was head of the World Evangelical Fellowship, is going, in 1985, he goes to a conference, because there's a lot of conferences, if you don't want to read about conferences, you shouldn't buy the book. But I try to make them interesting. So he goes to this conference, which is an evangelical conference in South Africa, in a, in a town in Western, on the Western Cape. And he's there to preach. You know, he's the special guest speaker. And there's a guy named Cesar Molabatsi who's there, who is head of Youth Alive and is an evangelical and had gone to college in Wheaton College, had come to Wheaton and gone back. And Caesar's being pressured by some of the missionaries who are at the conference, white, uh, German, and American missionaries, that he, as a black evangelical Christian, should stand up and denounce black theology. And Molabasi <clears throat> won't do this. He has been influenced by James Cone, like so many other people. Um, he is an evangelical, but he understands that liberal Christians have done some good things on this apartheid question, so he won't do it. David Howard, who's just like not even that political of a guy except his like fundamental, like instinctive conservatism, but he sees the pressure of Caesar's bullying being put under and he sort of supports him and says, Oh, you know, I don't don't let them bully you, kind of thing. So Caesar says, I would like you to come to my house tomorrow for lunch. 
he lives in Soweto. So David Howard does, because he's the kind of guy who's going to go to lunch with any other Christian who he can, you know, who invites him. And they're having lunch in Soweto, and the South African Defense Forces come sweeping in and arrest them all. <laughs> so David Howard gets arrested in South Africa. And he comes back and starts preaching against apartheid. So these encounters happen, this tension between a political encounter and an enchanted or an emotional one happens, I think, I see it from Congo in the 1960s to, to Sudan in 2010. I mean, I just see it over and over again. But over and over again, these connections are what allow people to make, to have their political claims heard. You know, maybe Americans in general, American evangelicals certainly tend to like things at the individual level. So reaching people or knowing people personally often has an influence on how people are able to begin to hear political claims. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, Catherine? I'm Catherine. Catherine Marshall from the Berkeley Center. I'm curious as to how you see gender issues um, on the national or even on the international stage playing out. Um, part of the reason I ask is that I know that there are some evangelical communities, and I went to a meeting at Wheaton, and there's going to be another meeting at Wheaton just after Thanksgiving of women within evangelical communities <coughs> essentially addressing issues of what they see as patriarchy, uh, the whole range. And is this a fringe, or is this a trend, or how much do we know about it? Um, that's a really good question, and I, I can answer it domestically a little bit better, so I'll just start with that. Um, I wrote a little bit about, well, I wrote an article in the Washington Post about Beth Moore and her role in um, speaking out about sexism in the evangelical community. And Beth Moore is a very beloved teacher in the Southern Baptist Convention. She's a teacher because she can't be a preacher. Um, and I love the way that people navigate that line. So you can watch her on YouTube. And if you can tell me exactly what the difference is between a teacher and a preacher, when you see her, I would love to hear it because she looks like a preacher to me, but she doesn't, she preaches either only to women or on YouTube or other videos where not only women are watching, I'm pretty sure, um, but she doesn't claim to preach to men or to be interested in preaching to men or having authority over men. Um, but so she has held that line in uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, which has not allowed women to have authority over men more. I mean, this not was this were not true in the 70s and 60s, but it has been true in the Southern Baptist Convention in the last uh, 30 years, 25 years. Um, and but she spoke out, and in part as a result of Me Too, and in part as a result of some of the things that had been uh, happening in the Southern Baptist Convention. She spoke out and said she had faced so much discrimination and scorn from her other fellow evangelical teachers and preachers, um, talked about being in an elevator where none of the other men who were speaking at the, San, at the same event would acknowledge her as you know, even being in the room, much less as a, as a peer. Um, and that had quite an impact. I mean, a lot of people were influenced by her because she's so well known and so well loved. And a number of other people have made those kind of statements. I certainly not a fringe. Where it goes, I don't really know. I, I, you know, they, the Southern Baptist Convention has elected um, J.D. Greer as the new president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and he is, you know, by contemporary standards, pretty moderate. Um, but he holds what he calls a um, modified complementarian stance which I think means a nice, like, compassionate conservatism or something. It's like a nicer version, but I don't see him saying that he sees uh, much challenge to the fundamental notion of, of women and men having fundamentally different roles to play. Um, some of the folks who had been leading, some of the women who had been leading the charge 
have ended up leaving or um, being left <laughs> from evangelicalism like Jen Hatmaker and uh, a few others. So um, Rachel Evans. So I think that it, it's to me it's a little unclear. My my friend and colleague Marie Griffith, who writes about this, I think um, feels more like something really might be happening. So I, I'm interested that she thinks so. That might be right. I tend to feel a little more like um, the, at least in some of the, you know, it's certainly in the SBC, but some of the other, um, the impact of this highly conservative ideology in the U.S. has been so strong over many years that I don't see it getting, I don't, I don't think we're going to see, you know, um, a kind of collapse of those arguments or those structures. I don't see a revolution in the making right now, but I would love to be wrong. So we've got three people. We've got the corner here, then CJ, then Galen. So, and we'll, we'll come to you fourth. So let's try to keep the questions shorter. I just want to make sure we get everybody. I think it's the answers that are the problem. No, 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 no. The answers are never the problem. <laughs> Please. Hi, Jim Hagen. I'm with the uh, CCO Campus Ministry here at Georgetown, semi evangelical campus ministry. Uh, what I'd like to ask you a question about is, is just the role, and you might cover this in, in your book, but the, the role of eschatology as you were talking about the church growth movement and the Jesus, Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s was very, um, I hope this is not too fancy of a theological term, but it was very dispensational. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that the younger generation of evangelicals is disconnected from dispensationalism and even some of the seminaries, it's uh, it's been on the wane. But I think that you know, it's also tied heavily into uh, the American project, you know, mm -hmm. the city on the hill, and the um, the new heavens and the new earth that, that the Puritans were going to create in New England, etc. And that's that's deeply embedded um, in in American culture. But the um, the connection to global evangelicalism, if you could comment on that regarding eschatology as, as we move away from dispensationalism, have you seen uh, more of a growth, more of an openness, and particularly regarding institution building and how, how missions are done? More openness to, uh, to, to, to eschatology, to prophecy, that kind of thing? No, more of an open, openness to less of a American <clears throat> dispensational View and more of a global Christian universal, yeah. as, a, as a universal faith? Yeah, that's a um, complicated question. I'll, I'll say first that the first chapter I wrote for this book was a chapter on the Left Behind novels and the role of prophecy. The Left Behind novels were bestsellers after starting in 95 and going to, there were 12 of them going to the mid-2005, like and there were 12, and at least five were on the New York Times bestseller list, and they were these adventure stories about the end times when Jesus returns. And um, the, the, the people who, uh, just to say that it's about the, you know, the world after the rapture, after Christians are taken into heaven, and it turns out in those novels that most of the American Christians who are left seem to be pilots because they go all over the world, you know, saving everybody. Uh, so pilots get left behind. So. <laughs> um, There's a listener somewhere. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that chapter didn't make it into the book. And the reason it didn't was because one of the things in my own thinking, I do talk about prophecy throughout uh, several points in the book, and I'll, and I'll come back to that, but that my own thinking about the evangelical project of global connection, and I got interested in the connections more than the separations, Pro the, the specific ways that Americans do prophecy does not, is, is not unheard of in other parts of the world, for sure, but it seems like it doesn't travel quite in the, in the way that um, some other aspects of evangelical life and culture do. Um, and so I, I do write about it. I write about it in the chapter on, on Israel, but I write about the ways that Americans imagined Israel both before and after 67, because that, was, that war was seen as a real, for people who were interested in prophecy, a real um, fulfillment of prophecy. And now Israel controls all of Jerusalem, and surely lots of things are going to happen. But one of the ways that my own thinking changed is I started, so that, that chapter is partly about that. 
but it's also partly about tourism. I guess I got interested in the more kind of quotidian ways that people engage the rest of the world, and tourism to Israel is a huge, it, many people need to write more about it. There's been a couple of uh, good studies, but tourism to Israel had such an influence on how Americans thought about Israel and how they thought about Jews overall, it, both before and after 67. And tourism changes a lot at, with, with 67, because now you can do much more of the Holy Land through Israel, where before you had to go to Lebanon and then Jordan and then across and into Israel to do all the different sites you might want to do. So tourism became much easier, and the Israelis made very self-conscious use of bringing people in. Um, but it, to, to to focus on your question about eschatology, so um, I think that my sense is that there was a kind of, there used to be this kind of premillennial dispensationalism was the way you did prophecy, right? And that's the, the American model and that's how people thought about it and there were many, many, many studies and books and things written about it. But with the, um, 1040 window and the rise of the idea of, of that, that map where you would focus your missionary work on this part of the world where Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism were a majority <coughs> that is announced by Lewis Bush in 1989. A lot of the kind of end times enthusiasm gets transferred over in a way to let's, we're almost at the year 2000 and maybe we're going to reach all of the nations by 2000 and let's focus on the 1040 window and you can buy your coffee mug with the 1040 window <laughs> on it and your calendars and, um, and there was a lot of enthusiasm that um, it seemed to me sort of took some of the energy of prophecy, took some of the energy that, that prophecy talk often takes of millennial hopefulness, things are going to be different any minute, that kind of feel that I think prophecy talk often has as well. Um, and now that's no longer something that people focus on the 1040 window, although of course they focus on Islam a lot. Um, and I think that the prophecy is still an enormous subsection of the, you know, the internet, for example, and, uh, and, and how many people engage it, and I think actually including a certain number of young people, but it seems to me to have far less of the um, youthful energy that it did. You know, when Hal Lindsey published The Late Great Planet Earth, you know, he was talking like, he was trying to sound very hippie. I don't know if you've ever actually read the book. It's impossible to read at this point because it's, it's like all about let's have a rap about when Jesus is coming and it sounds like it was written in 1972, which it was. Um, but now I think that, that energy that prophecy often had it seems to me to be going in other directions. I don't see it as having that kind of energy, but I still think it's a very big subfield. Um, and I think in the same sense that the dispensational orientation may not have transferred, but um, in a lot of, especially, in, well, including the Pentecostal churches in Africa, there is a kind of sense of the end times are coming that is very real and very present. But it, and there's a lot of biblical eschatesis around that, but it doesn't seem to me to model um, the end times the, the dispensational model in the same way. I have a friend, Anthea Butler, who's writing a book about now about prophets, about um, Pentecostalism in, in Nigeria. And when her book comes out, I think we'll know a lot more about exactly how people are taking up and leaving those parts behind. All right, let's go to the speed round version. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to ask CJ, ask your question, then Galen ask yours, and then uh, if you could ask yours, and then we'll give Melanie a shot at picking and choosing. Uh, so CJ, raise your hand. So, um, CJ Pine, State Department Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations as a contractor. Um, I'm asking more out of personal interest. Um, I'm curious if you can talk about what kind of reaction you've got, you've received from the, um, received to the book from um, evangelicals, particularly those that identify as more conservative, or when you were doing interviews, how people would react. You framed the book. Thanks. Okay, Galen. Galen Carey, National Association of Evangelicals. Um, so you're probably familiar with the work of Robert Woodbury at um, Baylor, and I'm wondering if you have interacted with that in the book and how you see, uh, he talks about the, the very widespread impact of Protestant mission work in terms of supporting uh, democracy and prosperity and so on. 
Uh, but it seems to me that maybe we, that's not well known, particularly by critics of uh, the evangelical movement. And uh, so if you can interact with that, I appreciate it. And, and then, last question. Well, I'm Suzanne Monard. I'm not affiliated to anything. I'm from Switzerland, so uh, the interest I have is in the position of women in the evangelical church. I have a question. Um, should I have the question now? Okay. Um, so, uh, do you think that uh, many women uh, became uh, uh, missionaries because uh, it was a way to escape uh, the, the ban on teaching and preaching? And uh, do you know the ratio of uh, women versus men uh, missionaries in the world, uh, that are US uh, women? Um, I'll take that one first. Uh, just quickly, I don't know offhand the numbers, but I do know that uh, American women became missionaries in pretty high numbers and um, were absolutely crucial part of the missions force. Um, certainly in the 40s through the 70s, uh, single American women are um, all, you know, serving all over the world. They would usually not be serving as pastors, but they would be serving, they may be doing some teaching, they would be serving as nurses, as teachers in the, you know, in the schools, um, as various kinds of support. They would serve as missionaries. And it definitely, I write in, at some length about one woman missionary in Congo in the, in the 60s, and she was really quite an adventuresome person. I and mean, you had to be, to be a young woman and show up and go be a missionary in Congo is, uh, is quite, quite a striking kind of person. Um, and she definitely saw it as a kind of way to, she didn't ever say, I'm doing this to break out of the roles at home, but she definitely did break out of the roles at home in her job and she, uh, worked as a nurse in uh, a very, very difficult part of Congo. Uh, American missionaries evacuated Congo three times in the period that I'm looking at, 1960 to 1964. She never left. So she was brave, she was tough, and um, I think it provided opportunities for women like that that a lot of other jobs might not have. It also provided a, a, a way to be respected and um, to have a, a, a life um, a kind of idealized life even if you didn't get married. And so for a lot of women that's in that period certainly was not always available at home but was available as a missionary. Um, in terms of the reaction, um, I'm still seeing, the book it hasn't been out that long, I, um, John Fay who wrote Believe Me um, uh, likes the book. Uh, he did an interview with me um, and uh, I I think a number of other people who we would sort of say as like moderately conservative evangelicals um, that I know see themselves in the book in a lot of ways. Um, not uncritically, but see that I'm trying to engage with evangelicals in a way that is, um, that is not condescending, that treats people like I would like to be treated, which is that people can disagree with me, just don't treat me like I'm an idiot. Um, and so I think that, I hope that means that there is a potential uh, evangelical audience for the book. My father, who is um, a, a good old Southern boy who doesn't know much about religion um, and is a secret atheist, though I guess I've just outed him, um, told me everybody's gonna hate you. <laughs> I was like, I don't think everybody will hate me. Um, but, um, you know, the book is, I think that what the book is, is it's a book written by a person who, my, my politics are on the left, so that is something I'm not trying to beat anybody over the head with, but it's clear that, you know, when the social concern people are trying to rise at Lausanne, I don't think it's, un, you know, I think my views are clear that I'm happy about that, and I'm sad when they lose, and you know, that kind of thing. So, um, depending on one's tolerance for that. You'll see how you might think about the book. Um, evangelicals of color are, have generally been quite positively responsive, and my friend, um, well, he's not, he's not really a friend, he's somebody I respect and uh, know a little bit, Ebenezer Obader, who's a historian of African Christianity, uh, wrote a review of the book in which he said he felt like 
it was really important that somebody writing about American evangelicalism be really getting that the African Christians um, that are interacting with Americans see themselves as the future of the faith. Um, and that yeah, that's his view and that was, that's my view in the book, that that's how people see themselves and, they, and I think they do. Um, I didn't really deal with Woodbury's argument in my book at all. Um, I know it, but because this is a, um, a U.S. history in some sense, a U.S. history happening all over the world, but um, I didn't take, take it on myself to either argue with or disagree or agree with his argument that missionaries have um, played a role in making places more democratic. I do talk a lot about the ways that um, people in other countries, including primarily looking at Christians in other countries, have seen missionaries. And as you know, that's sometimes been pretty, um, those relationships have been pretty tense at times, seeing mission American missionaries as overly invested in their Americanness, overly invested in their whiteness, overly invested in their capitalism, a range of different things. Um, I'll just end with a, um, a story from the, one of the early chapters of the book, which is when um, American missionaries are evacuated out of eastern Congo, and the, there's real violence there. Um, and people are really are in danger. So when they evacuate, they're not just, you know, there's a real reason to evacuate. People are in danger because the rebels see missionaries um, as allied with colonialism, and they see themselves as challenging the remnants of colonialism, and they're likely to target missionaries. They're unfortunately also likely to target Christians. So um, when the missionaries evacuate, the local Christians don't get to evacuate. And they're mad. They might understand, some people do understand, but when the missionaries come back in one part of Eastern Congo, um, the local Christians uh, don't want them back, or some of the local Christians don't want them back. So then there's a fight in the local church of those who wanna let the missionaries come back into the churches and the schools and those who are gonna take over the churches and the schools and tell the missionaries um, they, don't, they shouldn't come back. And there's though a group of them write President Kennedy and say, you know, your compatriots in Congo are really misbehaving. And what is this, the Baptist mission of rifles and cudgels? Wow. And, you know, they don't get an answer, but, um, <laughs> you know, there is, a, there is a conflict, and a real conflict over, um, again, it's that beginning moment when people are beginning to say, you know what, these are our churches. These are our schools. We're gonna claim them. Maybe you don't get to come back after you left. Um, and that is a, you know, again, other people are saying, we want you back, we appreciate the missionaries. You know, it's not a uniform thing, but there are real tensions that arise um, from then to the end of the story I tell. So, sorry, we're out of time. Uh, we uh, have books for sale. I think we're gonna move the books up here. Is that, am I right on the logistics of that? It's any, we'll work on that, we'll get an answer. Uh, please join me in thanking Melanie for this time. It's a wonderful book.